For over 30 years, I've been traveling around the world reporting on cultural history, tourist attractions, and what's good to eat and drink. During those years, I learned a lot about where to go and what to do when you get there. I also spent over 5,000 nights in various hotels. Some were great, and some were um, not so great. I thought you might like to see the great ones, so we put together a program with some of my favorites. The George Sank is a perfect example. On January 17, 1928, the George Sank opened in Paris. It was owned and partially designed by Joel Hillman. Hillman, who was born in Memphis, Tennessee, had a long history of operating successful restaurants and hotels in the United States. He eliminated the word hotel from his Paris property in order to give people the feeling that his place was a private home rather than a commercial establishment. The French press described it as conceived in the spirit of modern and elegant luxury and endowed with the latest technological innovations. And that would still be a good description of the property. They had fitted closets, and they still do. They had an elaborate delivery system so your room service order was properly heated when it arrived in your room, and they still do. And the attention to detail is amazing. It's one thing to have a traditional American or continental breakfast brought to your room, but the Four Seasons offers a classic Japanese breakfast. Ayo gozamas. But for me, the most luxurious element was the introduction of two bathrooms in each suite so that two people could bathe at the same time and be ready to go down to dinner together. Not that that's actually ever happened to me, but it's a great theory. In 1997, Four Seasons Hotels took over the management of the property and spent over $125 million on renovations. These days, the property is known as the Four Seasons Hotel, George Sank, and it's more luxurious than ever. Art Deco details in the windows and balconies were restored. Hallway arches were brought back to their early size. Much of the original art has been restored and returned, including a set of 17th century tapestries. Christopher Norton is the general manager. We create in the Georges V this, this bubble and this special place that when you come and stay with us, you feel cocooned, you feel safe, and uh, we remove all uh, obstacles and things that could weigh on your, on your life. So you can concentrate on what is important to you and we'll take care of all the rest for you. The Sank is the main restaurant in the hotel. It's been awarded two of a possible three stars by the Guide Michelin, and that's a big deal. Thierry Jacques is the restaurant manager. We started eight years and a half ago in this wonderful place, and it was a, a gift every day because when we arrived, it was completely empty. It's in gold and gray in terms of color with the wonderful uh, florals. The service is very professional, very friendly. And what shall we drink with dinner? Mm, difficult question. Over 50,000 bottles of the world's finest wines rest below the hotel in what was once the quarry that supplied stones for the construction of the Arc de Triomphe. There's a second wine cellar that is used to keep about 100 different champagnes at just the right temperature for immediate use. And a third wine cellar just outside of Paris where another 10,000 bottles are slowly aging to maturity. The spa in this hotel is a magical place. This spa uh, stays true to a French environment. It's, it's indigenous to France. So if you go to the spa, you will see the murals and the decor reflective of a classic French garden, including the water features and the swimming pool, and, and it's just delightful. The, the French version of Zen. 
it's a very, very popular place for our hotel guests to go and take two hours of the day to, to re-energize themselves. Of particular interest to me was the relaxation room. The frescoes on the walls are designed to recall a summer walk in the gardens of Versailles before the revolution. One of the most extraordinary elements in the hotel are the flower arrangements. Each week, Jeff Latham and his seven assistants design a new theme for the hotel and utilize over 9,000 flowers to design 23 major arrangements and 150 smaller bouquets. And the rooms are pretty magnificent. Each month, the hotel receives over 200 young guests. And accordingly, they've developed a series of programs to make sure the young guests are happy. As a man who is a father, a grandfather, and about to enter my second childhood, I have a great appreciation for their young guests' program. Upon check-in, each child receives a small personalized booklet with helpful hints. They get a t-shirt with their name on it, a plate of kid-friendly snacks, animal-shaped soaps for the tub, wooden letters for playtime. They also get to choose a welcome gift from a toy-filled basket. Racing car. I think I'm going to go with uh, the tiger who came to tea. What a great choice. I love this place. Prague is the capital city of the Czech Republic and one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. It was relatively undamaged during the Second World War and somehow managed to survive a massive onslaught by communist architects. During the past few years, I have paid a number of visits to Prague, sometimes during the summer and sometimes during the Christmas and New Year's celebrations. And each time I stayed at Prague's Four Seasons Hotel. It has a great location on the riverbank looking out at the palace complex. And it's at the edge of the historic old town, so everything is in easy walking distance. The public rooms in the hotel have an intimate quality, and I put them to good use. Public areas in hotels and cafes are designed for waiting and meeting and you need a couple of things to make them work. You should be able to sit down because you never know when someone is going to be late, to order something to drink, and to look like you are not waiting for someone while in fact you are waiting for someone. And try to control your reaction to what you read in the newspaper. When do I get my bail out? The hotel also has a collection of Czech art that ranges from old lithographs to modernist abstract paintings to works in glass. This is a piece of art by a very famous Czech artist who works in glass. And it's got lots of holes in it and broken. And it's being held together kind of like by glue. And the story is that it's a symbol of the falling apart of the communist regime or it could be that he finished this beautiful piece and then he dropped it and he thought, oh my God, this is so expensive. I kind of want to have to throw this out. So I, I think I'll just paste it together and make a great story. The hotel has a restaurant that has been awarded a star by the Michelin Guide and it's the first restaurant in Central and Eastern Europe to win one. The chef is Andrea Accordi, who was born in Verona and reflects his Italian heritage in three of his favorite dishes. We started with homemade potato gnocchi with morel mushrooms and red prawns, topped with creamed trumpet zucchini and carrot foam. The main course was suckling pig with mashed potatoes, sweet and sour pepper shallots, bacon, and warm chanterelle mushrooms with crispy vegetables. And for dessert, Sicilian cannoli filled with buffalo ricotta cheese, pistachio yogurt, essence of almond sorbet, and sangria syrup.
rooms are pretty cool too. And so are the views they offer, especially the vistas of the rooftops, beautiful sculptures that you might easily miss from the streets. The hotel is particularly interested in family guests, and while I was there at Christmas time, they invited the Prague Opera to host a holiday tea party for children, which I shot on my minicam. Often, the key to my comfort in the hotel is the concierge, and the Four Seasons in Prague has one of the best, Petra Zazula. A good concierge can tell you where to eat and where to shop. They can tell you what's overrated and what is yet to be discovered. They can get you tickets to events that are considered unobtainable. But Petra also has one skill that I had never seen before. Dozens of times each day, a concierge is asked about a location. Map comes out, gets marked, and the guests are on their way. Petra takes out the map, but he turns it towards the guest and marks it as you look at it. Petra has learned to write backwards, so his guests can better follow his instructions. Each time I come back to Prague, something new has been added and someone at the hotel always knows where to find it. Towards the end of the 1100s, a group of herring fishermen decided to build a settlement at the mouth of the Amstel River. They drove wooden stakes into the mud, bound some wet earth and seaweed around the stakes, and patched together a few huts on top of the mounds. Nothing to brag about, but still something you could call home. There was, however, one serious problem. At high tide, home was about three feet underwater. So they built a dam to hold back the sea, and the people called the place the Dam on the Amstel. The city plan for Amsterdam is based on three canals that form three semicircles, one inside the other. Together, they are described as the Canal Girdle. The outside canal in English is called the Prince's Canal. In the middle is the Emperor's Canal. And on the inside, the Gentleman's Canal. It's interesting that the most elegant and ambitious of the three is not those named with royal titles. It's the Gentleman's Canal. The Dillon Hotel is located on one of the city's most famous canals. Well, the hotel is located in the oldest part of Amsterdam, uh, on one of the most beautiful canals. Uh, and that area is called the Nine Little Streets, the Negen Straatjes, which is very famous for shopping, design shops and good restaurants. So it's a very quiet residential area. It is a very hidden, uh, small little boutique hotel with only 41 rooms. So we have uh, 16 rooms in the new wings. And I must say the new wing is from 1880. And then the remainder of the rooms are here in the old part. The combination of history, you know, like the beams here and the brick floor, and in the combination with the furniture and the uh, nowadays technology, uh, that makes it a very nice blend. It's a small restaurant with only 10 tables there. We do serve there breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but try and really to make a destination restaurant. I brought in a new chef and a completely new cuisine, which we thought needs to be embedded in the Amsterdam market. What I like very much are the attic rooms, where you see the beams and the structure of the roof. And the view is very nice. And then in the new building we have that very minimalistic, whitish, Japanese sort of rooms, which is so contrary to the rooms here in the old building.
the Ariana room, which is exactly the site where the first theater was. This is a room we just uh, rebuilt one and a half years ago. And it's now our function room and that holds up to 80 people. But it's a very dramatic look. It has a very nice art design wall with different light scenarios. So that makes the room very suitable for social events, for weddings, for meetings, presentations, whatever. And that in combination with a courtyard combining those buildings is a fantastic location. We have a very old antique saloon boat built in 1930, so we have an exclusive contract with uh, the owner. And whenever we have guests who would like to see uh, Amsterdam uh, from the waterside, which is, by the way, the nicest way to explore Amsterdam, we call them up and then uh, we have a small little boat landing in front of the hotel, and then we do tours. What we are trying to do is to make really a tailor-made package for them, whatever they would like to do and whenever they would like to go. We, uh, we offer them a full catering on board, even with the waiter and the cook, so we have small cooking facilities on board, so we can do small little dishes, appetizers, and of course uh, celebrate a party up to 12 people uh, on board. And next to that we have 10 Johnny Loco design bicycles in front of the hotel and, and our type of guests, they love exploring the city and the best thing to do that next to the boat is riding a bicycle. The nice thing about the bar, which used to be sort of a private dining room, we transformed it into a bar and it's very nice for locals after work coming in for drink. We have two beers, the local beer is Heineken of course, and we have the Brand beer that comes off, uh, from the south of uh, Holland, which is a little bit uh, more of an upscale beer and uh, we'll try one today. Amsterdam's Dillon Hotel is modern, elegant, very fashionable, and totally responsive to the needs of its guests. This is Provence, in the southeast corner of France. It's a region that runs for 180 miles between the Riviera on the Mediterranean Sea and the mountains that rise up into the Alps. The fields are covered with flowers, olive groves that produce some of the world's finest olive oil, vineyards that produce the light and pleasant wines associated with the area, and hills topped with picturesque villages that have been around for over a thousand years. One of my favorite villages is Fayence, Jean-Jacques Yomé is the chief concierge at the Four Seasons Resort in Provence, and he took me on a tour. What were the days that the market was open? Excellent little restaurants, outdoor cafes, and a small but interesting open market filled with things I like. Spice cakes. I like spice cakes. Another one of my weaknesses. I like nougat. I like cheese. No shopping until the tasting is complete. It's a tough act. That's wonderful. You'll also find the town of Grasse, which is the world epicenter for the perfume industry. Provence is an ideal place to relax and get in touch with the natural rhythms of the world around us. But if you're into a more cosmopolitan lifestyle, you have the beaches at Saint-Tropez. There's also the glamour of Cannes, which was a small fishing village until the 1830s, when it was transformed into the chic town that hosts the world's most important film festival. And about an hour to the east, the excitement of Monte Carlo. I came to this part of France to spend a few days at the Four Seasons Resort at Terre Blanche, which is an unusual property. 115 villas built on a hillside. Each has a bedroom and a living room with French doors that open onto a private terrace with expansive views of the mountain range. Olympic-sized bathtubs in elegant bathrooms. Well-defined work areas should you feel the need to work. But they're thinking about hiring a psychologist to help you suppress the feeling that you need to work. Some of the villas have their own private hot tubs. They have a Michelin-starred restaurant for serious eaters. And there's an intimate bar that specializes in local drinks. 
The drink most associated with this part of France is pastis, which has a licorice flavor. There's also an older and stronger version called absinthe. And the hotel serves it in the traditional way, known as an absinthe drip. The absinthe goes into a glass. A cube of sugar is placed into the funnel. The funnel is filled with ice and water is slowly dripped through into the glass, which dissolves the sugar cube into the liquor. Good God, Holmes, it's working. The absinthe turns cloudy white when it's mixed with the water. During the late 1800s, absinthe was the drink of choice amongst artists and writers. People like Oscar Wilde, Vincent van Gogh, Toulouse-Lautrec, they were absinthe drinkers. Then in 1908, for reasons nobody understands, the government decided it was dangerous and they banned its manufacture. And you couldn't get an absinthe drink for almost 100 years. Then in 2006, for more reasons we don't understand, the government said it was okay to have absinthe and it's being manufactured again. So here's looking at you. Across from the bar is an informal restaurant with both indoor and outdoor areas. A grill next to the outdoor pool. And a restaurant attached to the spa that specializes in light and healthful dishes. And there's the spa. Treatment rooms where you can treat yourself to a bit of pampering. Fitness facilities if you feel the need to be a bit more fit. Fantastic pools both inside and out. And everything you would expect in a world-class spa. The resort also has a series of special programs for children. There were lots of kids at the resort when I was there, and some of us attended a special cooking class. But I also came here to celebrate my birthday. There are two ideas being celebrated at a birthday. The first is all about measuring. How old are you? How far have you come? The second is the concept of initiation into something new. Make a wish for your future. The centerpiece is the birthday cake. The person blowing out the candles is saying, the years of my life represented by the candles are over and gone. But I still have the breath of life in me. I am in control. I can blow them away and start anew. The flame on the candle is a symbol of life. But the candle, like life itself, only lasts for a limited time. Everybody joins in the appreciation of the birthday person, and there is a traditional song. Wow, thank you. The music for Happy Birthday to You was written in 1893 by two sisters, Mildred and Patty Hill, who lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and actually held the first copyright. The words were added in 1924, and nobody knows who wrote them but the song is now the most commonly sung song in the Anglo-Saxon world. And I hope to hear it being sung to me for many, many years into the future. And all things being equal, I wouldn't mind hearing them sung here at Terre Blanche. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Soup. They had an elaborate delivery system so your room service order was properly heated when it arrived in your room, and they still do. And the attention to detail is amazing. It's one thing to have a traditional American or continental breakfast brought to your room, but the Four Seasons offers a classic Japanese breakfast. Ayo gozaimasu. But for me, the most luxurious element was the introduction of two bathrooms in each suite 
so that two people could bathe at the same time and be ready to go down to dinner together. Not that that's actually ever happened to me, but it's a great theory. In 1997, Four Seasons Hotels took over the management of the property and spent over $125 million on renovations. These days, the property is known as the Four Seasons Hotel George Sank, and it's more luxurious than ever. Art Deco details in the windows and balconies were restored. Hallway arches were brought back to their early size. Much of the original art has been restored and returned, including a set of 17th century tapestries. Christopher Norton is the general manager. For over 30 years, I've been traveling around the world reporting on cultural history, tourist attractions, and what's good to eat and drink. During those years, I learned a lot about where to go and what to do when you get there. I also spent over 5,000 nights in various hotels. Some were great, and some were um, not so great. I thought you might like to see the great ones, so we put together a program with some of my favorites. The George Sank is a perfect example. On January 17, 1928, the George Sank opened in Paris. It was owned and partially designed by Joel Hillman. Hillman, who was born in Memphis, Tennessee, had a long history of operating successful restaurants and hotels in the United States. He eliminated the word hotel from his Paris property in order to give people the feeling that his place was a private home rather than a commercial establishment. The French press described it as conceived in the spirit of modern and elegant luxury and endowed with the latest technological innovations. And that would still be a good description of the property. They had fitted closets, and they still 